off with storytelling. You really have to become a master storyteller. Whether you're going to be a cinematographer, a production designer, a costume designer, all these disciplines are what we use to tell our story through. Mm -hmm. So in fact, let's understand what the narrative is mm -hmm. and what the essence of that narrative, the tone, the emotion you were talking about, the intellect and emotion as a balance mm -hmm. and how we're going to tell that narrative and then how we're going to use our personal or respective discipline to communicate that narrative. What is our vision? So these are the sorts of things that I really yeah. talk about or in my master classes. And, I, and yeah. I, you know, yeah. I think what's important, we're, we live in, a, in a, a, a pretty interesting age where the, the making of a film is actually accessible. Mm. Yes. I mean, the equipment that oh, we can, what oh my God, yeah. we can use. You know, on this last the film... software does yes. everything for you now. Yes. The last film that Nadia and I just did in South Africa, mm -hmm. um, uh, we used um, Alexas for the main shoot for, for, for A and B camera. Mm -hmm. And the C camera was a, was a Nikon. And we've, we used it for inserts and just grabbing a different angle and things yeah, like yeah. that. We just put one of the lowly members of the camera crew onto it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd set it up and, mm -hmm. and he just focus and sure some of it was in some of it, some mm. of it was out but it's been invaluable in the editing process to have that 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 angle mm -hmm. and that's a you know a camera that's uh, and lenses that are, that are you know that with it with its with its uh, video recorder part of it it's ninja is you know less than eight thousand mm. dollars and and mm. so suddenly you have all this at, at, at your fingertips um, and, and yeah. so my advice is, mm. uh, it doesn't have to be that fancy. Oh no, not at all. We know we the can. greatest filmmakers yeah. in history shot with. I mean, John Carpenter, and even Steven Spielberg when he made Duel. Yes. He made one of the greatest, most suspenseful Hitchcockian yes. yeah. films. That's right. But that's about the story. Yeah. That's about the narrative. It's Absolutely. about and the tone. Yeah. And it's about a master hand behind yeah. the scenes. Exactly. Being right. able it's the to it's the vision and being able to manipulate that. Yeah. And, and I and I you know I would I would think um, that that you you achieve that. Or if you're going to achieve it, you do it by practicing. And and if you have got that innate skill, it'll come out. Yes. Exactly. And and uh, we have this ability, as you say, yeah. we can we we can and edit. You've, you've really raised the issue too about we shouldn't be fragmented. We've got too much specialisation without the interlinking communication. Yes. When you're talking about this work, it's almost like ensemble work when we're all part of the whole and greater than the whole. With both of you together, because you are storytellers and you do hold all of this material in your unconscious and you're making it conscious so that it mirrors what you know for people, what's it like in, in your relationship working together and how does how does that come about? When yeah, that's a great relationship you guys have. <laughs> Uh, should we Look, ask our boys? Be, yeah, <laughs> we should ask our boys. Uh, can it be like a nuclear fission? Or, or Selena, our yeah. assistant, she knows too much. Um, <laughs> I, 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 um, Look, look. Obviously, there are like, there, are, there are. We have um, uh, both have a set of skills that are quite different, yeah. and uh, and they work well because they do intermesh. Mm. But you they're essential. A a, so it's it's yeah. much bigger than just two people. It it it, it really. It's, it's, to me, it's been the key. Yeah. Um, also, people often ask, how on earth do you work together? For the, well, in fact, so, mu so much of it isn't working together. There is so, when I'm writing, I'm yes. just out yes. there by myself. Yes. Um, when, when even in the uh, pre-production, Nadia's working with the actors. Mm -hmm. We get it wrong so many times mm -hmm. because it's not all part of the same vision. Absolutely. And if I'm going to be talking to you about something that's really intimate mm -hmm. and the shot suddenly that's being constructed by the cinematographer and the operator is way back there and it's in a wide shot, then I'm not giving the audience that information that they need to have. And it's also about the zeitgeist, uh, the feeling of the time, you know. For example, with um, David, you made Diana 
and me mm-hmm. in 1997, yes. which was a terrible coincidence oh, because was. Diana died that year and it was a yeah. great movie, great film. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, she well, died at that time. And yeah, it, we were going to release that week. Oh, that was coming just week. terrible. We'd done all the press and everything. It was just it how, was how horrendous. How did you take that news? I mean, was well, it? Well, I still remember to that day when yeah. I came home. And I'd just taken one of the boys to a party. Yeah. Chad's done that. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and Nadia, and she was at the back door, she said, have you heard? And I went, oh you know, I thought, oh my God, well, you know, who's died? And, well, it was Diana. And it was just, oh my God. But it, yeah. one of the things it did teach me was don't make a movie that relies on a person who's still living to stay alive. Interesting. Because, yeah. because, you know, it's completely out of your control and all yes. that money and all that time. Although the, the essence of that, of that story is so important. It's the concept of, you know, the paparazzi preying mm. on an individual. Mm. How does that affect their lives? And, mm. and you know, what, it, what is the, the projected end to that that uh, circumstance mm-hmm. it's not uh, so we can't categorically say don't you know don't make your film on somebody who's living I mean there are times where you've got to make that in order to be able to communicate a particular concept mm-hmm. so uh, but it was really unfortunate it was really speaking of concepts I was I was actually it was sitting in the back of my mind I was wanting to ask you what was it like working under the framework of Disney? Because I know they can be very strict. They have it has to follow certain guidelines for Formula, children yeah, and yeah. what tones you can yeah. use and what. Yeah. Was well, it like, very strict? It is very strict. Yeah. It's strict, but it's not. You know, it's not insurmountable. Okay. We have so many restrictions that are not necessarily like the restrictions that Disney can can bring forward or Warner Brothers or each one of these studios mm. has its own portfolio that it, it has its own envelope yeah. that they operate to and that's dictated to by their demographic I don't have to you know as a filmmaker I don't need to use bad language to communicate my concept mm-hmm. to communicate my vision mm-hmm. there is nothing wrong with working to an envelope you know, the creativity yeah, yeah. is you work out your boundaries, they're the boundaries. That's what promotes and now, creativity. Mm. And when now have... within that, yeah. you find exactly how you're going to tell that story in yeah. a most inventive and creative way. Mm-hmm. And I find that uh, challenging but brilliant. It's, it's a good really, stretch It's such for a you, great it? movie. Yeah. We really it enjoy it. It makes me, it, it really stretches me and I love that challenge. Yeah. And uh, I don't think that that concept or that pe- story or that communication with its audience mm-hmm. is going to be any better if I use swear words or or put in there uh, information that's you know that's going to be shocking and irrelevant to yeah. the demographic that I'm that I'm communicating with. I, I don't think that I don't think those restrictions that we're talking about for a long time in Australia we've always thought. Oh, you're working for a studio. Oh, isn't that bad? Mm. Well, actually, it's not bad. I think, um, from our perspective too, the interesting thing about these movies that we did, like like the Miracle Worker, was mm. that, it, that it all stemmed from our movie Amy, which um, and that's won uh, more awards than all your f- other yes, films. It's, it's been it's been quite extraordinary. Twenty eight you know, international that, awards. That, that, yeah, that, that was it, it, it's it's. And it, and it goes on and on that movie. It's mm-hmm. it's it's the Americans just cotton onto it straight yeah. away, mm-hmm. and they saw this extraordinary performance by a, a young woman. But it was also the story itself mm-hmm. and the way that Nadia had executed it. And really, there was a, it then it, there was almost it started a little industry for us, didn't it? And we every little girl. Um, you know, movie that those guys were making came came our way, which That's was crazy. It was it was fascinating. Really. So fascinating. now uh, we've made six movies with uh, little girls in the lead <laughs> in, for American studios. That's amazing. If you think about all the films that you enjoy watching, um, what are some favourites for you? Some favourite directors, some favourite films that sit with you? Um, I, I love. Uh, well, Sidney Pollock, oh, his yes. work. Brilliant. Jeremiah Johnson, one of my favourites. Incredible, yes. a filmmaker. Mm. And the wonderful thing about Sidney Pollock was, after we made Malcolm, 
we went to America and so on, and mm -hmm. we were so-called discovered and playing in the big pool. And uh, eventually, um, we, we were, I was in New York. I think David was somewhere else. I was in New York, and I was uh, at the actor's studio. Mm -hmm. I go to the actor's studio a lot. I started going a long time ago when I was young, and yeah. I continue to do so. Yeah. I go there and I audit scenes that are created on weekends or mm -hmm. during the week. And there are all sorts of professional people in there. On this particular day, Sydney was uh, doing a scene together with Cher. Cher was one of the actresses and there was another actor, mm -hmm. a the New York theatre act actor. Okay. So I'm auditing this, uh, this uh, scene and then straight after that scene, Sydney starts talking about this amazing movie that's come out of Australia. And he's talking about one of the scenes in Malcolm. Oh, <laughs> he's, he, that's so good. He that's talked so about good. the scene where Judith is explaining to Malcolm about why Frank uh, is the way he is. Yeah. His father was in a, a lunatic asylum. Yeah, and, yeah. And Sydney talk, talked about that scene for about a half an hour. Wow. He deciphered the whole what thing. What an amazing... And he said, the most exquisitely presented scene. And, you know, within this gem of a movie from Australia. And, and you're I'm sitting right there listening to it. It's like you didn't even know she was there. I have no idea. And so, oh, and but after it, I went... You know, after the session, I went to Sydney and I said, thank you, that was an amazing, you know, session. Yeah. And I got so much out of it. And... Uh, I directed it. And no, oh, I no, said, I said, oh, and he said, what's your name? And I said, my name's Nadia Tass. <laughs> and he just flipped. <laughs> said, what are you doing here? You should be in my position. You should be taking this set class. That's amazing. Wow, what a compliment for Here such we a were man. in Australia and we couldn't get distribution yeah. for Malcolm. Yeah. And then yeah. we, you know, and then you know, the distributors are saying, oh, what is this? It's comedy and drama. It's a bit of everything. And, you know, it's got to be re edited. Mm. And, but having grown up with storytelling and having been a storyteller forever, mm. I knew they were wrong. Yeah. The classics told me they were wrong. Yeah. Aristophanes, Euripides, Chekhov, they all told me they were wrong. Yeah. And uh, so David and I took it to the American film market, mm -hmm. and at the American film market, the distributors went nuts. At the end of the one screening, they, this is distributors from all over the world, yeah. it, there was a bidding war. Mm -hmm. And the very distributor who was saying to us, oh no, who was from who was from Hoyts. Yes. He was there with his little plastic bag leaning <laughs> against the pillar and he's watching all this hoo-ha about this Australian film. And then he came up to us and he said, What is it about your little film? Oh. And we said, Well, it is what it is but now you're going to have to pay for it. Right. Wow. That's an amazing story. There's so, something about your capacity to absolutely believe internally and trust your own way. Yes. Mm. Yes. But that comes from knowledge mm. and skill. Mm. It doesn't come mm. from, you see, this is what I try and teach the students that I have. It doesn't come from arrogance. Mm. And to be able to arrive at that point where you can trust, you have to have the knowledge. And to get the knowledge, you have to work. Absolutely. And, and you know, two o'clock in the morning, I'm still watching a movie. Oh, yes. Yeah. And trying to work out <laughs> what is it about Sorry it. Sorry, my that, life. That, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, yes. you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of sleeping. No, That's neither true. am I. Total waste of time. And yeah. you're so Total curious about everything. You're yeah. curious yeah, yeah, yeah. and you want to continually yeah. Yeah. learn. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And read. Yeah. Read, watch, read, discuss. Mm -hmm. yes. And so growing up in that sort of atmosphere, not only now with the family that David and I have created, 
but also in my, uh, you know, my family, in my original family. That's, that's the environment you grew up in. I grew up in an environment where everything was discussed. And there was nothing that was, oh no, you're a kid, you can't have an opinion. Yeah. You know, you had to have an opinion. Yeah. And so, so you have to gain, gain, get the knowledge. Once you have the knowledge... You're invaluable. That's your yeah. skill, that that's your power. Skill. Yes. And then you can mould your vision and execute that vision through this, the concept, or not just the concept, but the, through the practice of cinema. And furthermore, I, I find that a recurring theme in a lot of your movies, particularly the earlier ones, is you, you centre a lot of your protagonists uh, around this idea that they're the underdog and they're overcoming great odds. Like, they're quirky characters, they're the outsiders, and they're overcoming these difficulties and prevailing over society, yes. over greater things around them. My personal favourite was The Big Steel. And Big Steel is, to me, like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yeah. It's an yeah. amazing yeah. film. Yeah. And it has that quirky character, the protagonist played by Ben Mendelsohn. Yeah. And he's just so me. He's so the, the boy next door. Yeah. This is the kind of kid I was. Yeah. I was an absolute loser mm. in school. But I, I had such a, a, a vibrant imagination. Mm. And everything that I wanted and wished to happen when I was a teenager happened in that movie. Yeah. And we live vicariously through his character. And I find that that's something you do often in your movies. Um, yes. Yeah. The underdog has always appealed to me. Yeah. It's someone who I care about and I want to support. Yeah. Uh, it's like when I was 14, there was a kid who lived in the commission flats yeah. whose father was in jail and his mother was ta driving taxis to, to support her four kids. Yeah. Mm. And this little child, uh, I, I just got off a tram, this was in Fitzroy, I just got off a tram in my uniform, yeah. and uh, he was being held up mm -hmm. by the grocer that was there because this little kid, Leon, had just stolen uh, an orange. And so there I am, I look at Leon and, he, and he's being harassed. So I went over and I tried to find out what was going on. And what had happened was Leon hadn't eaten all that. Yeah. He was so hungry and he thought he could get away with it, basically. Mm -hmm. And they, and this boy was about to be taken into the courts and, you know, through, through the process which deems them criminals. And so by starting them on that road, we're creating yet another criminal. We're saying his father's in jail, this boy's inevitably going to go into jail as well. Yeah. That made me really angry, really crazed. I knew Leon was a sweet little kid who had no criminality in him. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, and, and that comes back to me so many times, mm -hmm. and it fuels me to look at the underdog. Not just look, but as soon as something happens and I recognise that the underdog needs support because of all these other forces that are so huge in mm. society and people can get lost so quickly. What you just said actually reminds me of Matching Jack, where you've got the kid who's in the middle of this thing going on with his parents where uh, his father's sleeping with all these other women, his mother only finds out about it at the hospital, and he's torn right in between it, and yeah. he's influenced by these forces. Yeah. Well, yeah. What kind of what changed your filmmaking tone from your earlier teen adventure romances yeah. to uh, the more darker? I think I'm looking at society and seeing how these, uh, these forces, these dark forces or these organised forces are insurmountable, like the bu uh, bureaucracy and corporations. Yeah. And I see how the little individual is getting lost in this in this world of corporations. And there's just no humanity. And manipulation, yeah, yeah. total manipulation, be it from a political arena or from bureaucracy. Or... So because that little individual is getting lost and basically has no avenue yeah. of breathing or for breathing, yeah. then it affects me.
and that's why I, uh, I focus on certain uh, narratives like Matching Jack yeah. or Fatal Honeymoon and I need to speak through them. Yeah. It's like the Roxburgh character uh, plays that corporate greedy kind of guy yeah. who just needs to get his selfish needs yeah. when, he, when he needs them. And then you've got the, the British guy. The British yeah, guy, that's Jimmy yeah. Nesbitt. Jimmy Nesbitt, sorry. He plays the more human central yes. role who brings a new life to yes. the family and he brings to the perspective. a new tangent, yeah. new perspective. He yeah. brings with him mythology that's based on humanity. Yeah. And it's through that it's mythology, yeah, that we find how to ease the pain yeah. of, uh, of death. It's about facing all of the feelings. Yeah. It's about acknowledging all of the feelings, to have love and hate and despair and joy yeah. and whatever. Yeah and that capacity you have to enable your viewers on that journey to experience everything. And we can hold it. We can hold it because we feel comfortable enough that you know mm. what you're doing yeah. because you're telling real truths. Yes, truth. absolutely. That, and that they're, the, they're the lessons, they're the things that I was introduced to through my early work in theatre. Yes. Um, plays like Blood Wedding, by Federico García Lorca, amazing, amazing playwright mm. who told, who tells so many truths through his work. I directed those, I acted in them, and when Blood Wedding I directed for the first time, I was young, I was mm. 18, and the reviews came out and they were really good. Yeah. My mother saw it and she said, well, if that's the best you can do, I think we should rethink your vocation. <laughs> yeah. And she told me why I had made mistakes or what the mistakes were yeah. in what I had created. Because she understood that narrative. Mm -hmm. And so who am I going to listen to, the critics? Or, uh, I mean, they're wonderful. They, they, you know, they, they were being nice to me, which yeah. was fantastic. But my mother was honest. Yeah. And honesty is hard to come yeah. by. And and it was honesty without the... It was painful, but it's without the lashing. Yeah. The yeah. esteem. And so then these are the, the... My build... I guess my building blocks that have given me the knowledge. And so now, at this time of my career, uh, I recognise where the pain is and I recognise how we can talk about that pain but couch it in humour so that in fact it's not going to bash people over the head oh, like a hammer not. and I think... It's like that gothic girl in Matching Jack, she comes yes. towards the end and gives... Yeah, and yeah. This, is, this is where, I mean, David's amazing skill in writing comes into yeah. it. He's, uh, he's nuts and I love that we can bring <laughs> that, you know, that madness through yeah. which we can find perspective on our pain, but from a point of humour.